On the 5th of November 2006, Ronald Castry was arrested for the murder of 11-year-old Leslie Molseed. She'd been abducted and killed 31 years earlier. I never once thought that my dad could have murdered Leslie. Never once. I think Leslie, poor Leslie, was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and sufficiently vulnerable for Castry to pick her up, take her away and kill her. This kind of case is every parent's worst nightmare. Leslie wasn't known to Castry's family. There was nothing connecting them. It was a totally opportunistic event. After living as a free man for more than 30 years, Ronald Castry was finally caught. I have no knowledge, and I've certainly never, never met this dead girl or any member of her family. It was so savage, a murder so brutal, that it could not be forgotten. Every day I wake up knowing I'm the son of a murderer, Ronald Castry, a murdering paedophile. It never goes away. My whole life has been a lie. So here we are on Delamere Road on Turf Hill Estate at Rochdale. Not a great deal has changed here. Everybody knows each other and everybody knew each other in 1975. It was in that year that West Yorkshire police were alerted to the disappearance of an 11-year-old girl called Leslie Molseed. Indeed, Leslie was well known throughout the community and this is where Leslie was sent out for her particular errand on Sunday the 5th of October 1975, perhaps about 12.30. You can imagine the panic at home when Leslie didn't return from a minor errand. I would say within an hour of her not coming back, her father went to the shop that she was supposed to get the bread from and she hadn't turned up there. So Leslie was a, an 11 year old Little girl, she barely weighed three stones in, in weight. It's just a little girl. We know that she'd had a learning disability, which is uh, an important factor, I think, in this case. Um, she was slightly vulnerable because of that. This is the pathway that Leslie came along and turned right to walk down Delamere Road and down to Stayups Lane at the bottom. Stayups Lane's the last place anybody saw Leslie. Police searched everywhere. Uh, Leslie's body was found three days later. She was on a grassy ledge, which was something like 14 feet above the carriageway. So here we are up the banking from the lay-by, and this is where Leslie's body was left, and this is where she was killed. A young girl, 11 years old, stabbed 12 times and sexually assaulted. Leslie's initial disappearance in 1975 is bound to have had a significant impact on the local community. Though the media wouldn't have been as quick as perhaps it would be today at reporting this, there would have still been significant word of mouth spreading across the local community and immediate increased fear about public safety. The killer, 21-year-old Ronald Castry, would get away with Leslie's murder for 31 years. My father's background, he came from a quite a privileged background and uh, he uh, was brought up going to a private school, piano lessons. Uh, he had everything money could buy. He was an only child, he was spoiled. He had every possibility of starting good in life. 
think my uh, father's mother, my grandmother, treated him well, spoiled him, idolised him. Uh, my grandfather, father's father, no, he bullied him. They didn't have a close relationship. On the one hand, you have this very almost spoilt identity where it's like, I'm wonderful whatever I do because my mum told me and my dad tells me I'm a terrible, terrible person, criticises me and picks on me and bullies me all the time. So you've got these two opposing messages in the same person. And so he seemed to develop an overcompensatory identity of I'm better than everybody else, quite self-serving, quite arrogant, as a way of dealing with the world. Ronald Castry met his wife Beverly in 1973 when he was 19 and she was 16. My mum was a telephonist when she met my dad. And uh, then apparently uh, all she wanted was to start a family and prove to her mum that she could be a good, good wife, good mum. So my father said to her, give up work. You bring the children up, Bev, I'll provide. She was solely dependent on him. At the start of the relationship, he appears to be, you know, supportive of her, desire to have a family, but also this is the beginning of that coercive control, you know, those invisible chains where somebody gradually gains full control over your life. In September 1975, Bev gave birth to her first child. Three weeks later, while Bev was still in hospital with her baby boy, Leslie Molseed was murdered. The police had no idea who the killer was, but almost two months later, in early December, some local girls came forward to report an incident that had occurred two days before Leslie's disappearance. On the 3rd of October, which was a Friday, there was an evidence of indecent exposure at a youth club on that Friday evening. A number of children saw a man in the shadows and they thought he was acting in an indecent way. And in fact, that did happen. A local milkman who had been at work all day needed to relieve himself and was doing that when some of the young girls saw him. The three girls, however, incorrectly identified the perpetrator as another man, one who'd find himself in the frame for Leslie's murder. Stefan Kishko emerged as a suspect. He was a, a local man that lived with his mum. He worked as a civil servant. He held a good job down and he was a good young man. But he was considered a little different. He was taken to the police station on a Sunday morning in December. He wasn't actually arrested. He was asked by the police to help with their inquiries. I'm not aware of any previous knowledge on the part of the police in relation to Stefan Kishko. I honestly think that it was the, the pressure of the homicide of a young child, a young girl, that caused some tension amongst detectives to want to clear this up, to want to be seen to be delivering a result on this murder case. There was nothing to link him to Leslie, to uh, the scene in which Leslie was found. There was nothing there. But he appeared to be a bit of a, a strange young man who lived fairly locally and might have exposed himself. And he was forced into a confession. He said, I had a knife in my pocket and I took it out and stabbed her in the throat. She was still crying. I got a hazy feeling, and I can't remember where or how I stabbed her. I got back into my car and drove home. I didn't tell my mother what I had done. False confessions are not as uncommon as we think. They can happen in these very high stress times where an individual perhaps isn't understanding the situation that they find themselves in, 
and so is going along with what they think will help them. On the basis of Stefan Kishko's confession, charges were brought against him, and in July 1976, he was put on trial for the murder of Leslie Molseed. I wasn't present at Stefan Kishko's trial, but I am aware of the nature of the prosecution and, and what the prosecution case was, and indeed the way in which the defence, for me, inappropriately conducted their defence tactics. The idea that he hasn't done this, but if you think he has, maybe it was manslaughter. Maybe he didn't actually mean to kill her. Trial lasted about two weeks. At the end of it, Stefan was found guilty. The major failing of the trial of Stefan Kishko was that the court never had it brought to its attention that Stefan Kishko could not produce sperm. It was known at the time that there was sperm in the killer's semen, and that should have been made known to the court. In July 1976, Stefan Kishko, an innocent man, was sentenced to 30 years in prison. The real perpetrator, Ronald Castry, was a free man, and just weeks before the trial had still been offending. Ronald Castry had committed an offence strikingly similar to his abduction of Leslie Mosey, a nine-year-old girl who lived ten minutes' walk away from Leslie's dress on the council estate. He got her into his car. He took her to a derelict house. I think he was about to do to her what he had done to Leslie. Thankfully, the little girl managed to escape and the police quickly apprehended Castry. He was charged with an act of gross indecency against this little girl. He was charged with indecent assault upon her. And uh, when it came to the magistrate's court hearing, it defies comprehension that for the two offences, he was fined £25 on each. No one in law enforcement realised that Castry's crimes were part of a pattern of attacking young children. Why did someone not connect the two offences? Castry had lived on that estate within a mile of um, Leslie's home. He would have been a prime suspect if anyone had looked. In 1979, Ronald Castry and his wife Bev welcomed another child, Nick. His younger brother followed in 1984. This is my childhood home, where I lived from when I was five years old till when I left when I was 17. This area is where I would play with my older brother on our go-kart, homemade go-kart, dumper truck when my brother got his motorbike, he used to let me have a ride on it with him. So this area does have a good few memories. But life for the Castry family was far from normal. There's a true saying, you never know what goes on behind closed doors. And it was a violent, unhappy, volatile atmosphere for any child to grow up in. They would just argue non-stop. They would be so black and blue. If she hadn't got the tea right, if, it, uh, if she hadn't cleaned the house right, uh, if she didn't bring him a, a drink of whiskey in an evening, you know, uh, you, you can't get anything right, Bev. You waste the time. So the worst memory I have of my childhood home is my father breaking my mum's nose and blood exploding down the staircase. So this guy had done a phenomenal job of cutting Bev off from any source of support by reducing her to a submissive, terrified woman. And she had no family stepping in to say, he beat you black and blue, get out and come and stay with us. Instead, she had the opposite. Well, I've got no room for you, go back. What choices did she have? None. My only positive memory is Christmas morning, the one time that we could be happy and open our presents, and the one time he would 
uh, interact with his children and build the toys for us. Most days he would be a, a violent man, an angry man. It was like we, we always felt we, we were never wanted. We were just the, we were just the cover for him. I never understood really why. You know, children come into this world and the first people they attach to are their primary caregivers and that attachment makes or breaks a child. And that attachment is about and should be about love, security, fun, you know, containment, I keep you safe, boundaries, all of that. And what Nick is asking to this day, why didn't you do that for me when I was little? While Ronald Castry was free, Stefan Kishko was still in prison for the murder of Leslie Molseed, a crime he did not commit. Like all child killers, he was marginalized, threatened and brutalized in prison. He was attacked several times. He spent much of the time in solitary confinement for his own safety. Stefan's mother never gave up hope that her son would one day be released from prison. She was a frequent visitor wherever he went. He was constantly moved around the prison system. But faithfully, she and his aunt, they went to visit him. They were the only people who believed in his innocence. In Shaw, as Nick and his brothers grew up, they started to become aware of their father's inappropriate behavior. It was uh, late 80s that I clearly understood that my dad liked to uh, have a third person in the marriage and, and, and go out and find sex by somebody else. And he would be getting ready. Three quarter length black jacket. He was bald on top, but he'd grown his hair uh, into a ponytail. And he thought he was uh, attractive to the opposite sex. He thought he was the bee's knees. Uh, and he would be putting on his aftershave and be like, Where are you going, Dad? Going out, finding a girl. Your mum knows. Your mum would do what I'd ask her to do. I think what Ronald was doing was incredibly violent behaviour verbally to his, to his children, saying, I'm going out to have sex with other women because your mother is useless. And that kind of form of triangulation, you know, pulling other women in because the relationship you had wasn't good enough, is a terrible game to play with, with the people who are there looking up to you as a parental figure. And it's almost a kind of a, a divide and conquer approach to parenting. By the time I was uh, eight, nine year old, I knew what my dad was doing. I knew, I knew what sex was. I didn't realise just how dirty and perverted he was. So we know that sexual gratification was a significant motivator for Castry not only in his criminal behaviour, but also in other elements of his life. We know that he used sex workers, we know that he had multiple affairs, and ultimately, it was a key motivator in his murder of Leslie. To the outside world, Ronald pretended to be a successful businessman, running a comic book shop through the 80s and the 90s. So the business that my dad was in was uh, hardback books comics, porn magazines. It always seemed really busy and uh, successful. We always seemed to have money. I remember one day he came home with a Range Rover, you know, and I, it was like, gosh, Dad's brought this home. But it wasn't that successful. The house was falling apart. There was green mould up the walls. The windows were rotten. He never decorated it. I suppose not every family home has boxes and boxes, rows and rows of comics, Batman, you know, Spider-Man, but then there'd also be the pornographic stuff. Uh, and uh, we'd end up having to, he'd put me in plastic sleeves and you'd sell a tape them down and price them up. Uh, you know, and we had 12 out. 
At some point, I think Nick would have seen things that he knew was wrong, but he was he may have also felt confused as to why am I why am I seeing this and what's my dad doing? And I think that is the child's eye. What's happening around me? I don't understand it. But from the point of view of the grown-up, it sounds like that grown-up couldn't care less. It was all about him and his own needs and his own selfishness. And whether the child saw it or not was irrelevant to him. All I remember, my memories of my relationship with my father when I was growing up was him calling me hysterical, jumped up, queer. I didn't have many friends to confide in. And so, yeah, it'd it, it be uh, using homophobic language to me because uh, I didn't come out to him. In fact, I, ne I actually never came out to him. I just remember my mum really didn't say very much. It was like she was scared of him. She, you know, she wouldn't stick up for, for me, she, you know, other than just, you know, never mind, it's fine, don't worry about it, ignore him. Because I didn't understand what queer meant. I didn't understand why a father could say those things to the child. In 1992, after years of perseverance, Charlotte Kishko succeeded in clearing her son's name for the murder that had actually been committed by Ronald Castry 17 years earlier. Well, I was in a way framed because you know, the detectives just said, we'll just get it all wrapped up for Christmas and just end it somehow one way or another. With Stefan Kishko now in the clear for Leslie Molsey's murder, the police resumed the search for her real killer. I never heard my dad talk about Stefan. Uh, no, nothing was ever mentioned. Not when we were growing up or when we were around him. He certainly never really talked about her. Uh, the uh, the disappearance and murder of Leslie. Leslie Mulseed's family said they would never rest until whoever really killed her was brought to justice. I just remember on occasions they'd say, you can turn that rubbish off. In 1993, Stefan Kishko was awarded £500,000 in damages for his wrongful conviction for the murder of Leslie Molseed. But this was money he never received. Stefan was released. He was not at this time well enough to go home. He collapsed and died on the 23rd of December, 1993. His mother, who was so devoted to his case, died 20 weeks after he did. For killer Ronald Castry, life continued as normal. I don't remember an occasion where he wasn't abusive to my mum. When you hear your own father saying to your mum that marriage is legalised prostitution, that's all we ever heard. Women with it are just a piece of meat, there for one thing. Run the house and give the man sex. And that was his uh, attitude all the way through our childhood. A slow deterioration in my mum because my dad was always looking for, for, for sex from somebody else. He, he was just slowly breaking her down. I remember a few occasions where she said, stop going, you know, stop this run, don't go out, run. And he'd turn around and give her a backhander. It is a very perverse form of grooming to abuse your partner to your children and say, I'm going out there into the world to find other women to have sex with because she's useless. These other women are better than her. But women are objects. So it's a really perverse, distorted, dysfunctional form of educating your children about relationships. When Nick was a young teenager, his paternal grandfather, Eric, was arrested for indecency with a child. Not long after, he began to abuse Nick too. 
my dad's dad, he always agreed to take all grandchildren away to London when they were old enough. So he says, like, Nicky, he used to call me, Nicky's coming up to be old enough to take to London. Do you want to go? I've never been to London. So he agreed to uh, take me to London. By that point, I was 40, uh, about 1993. I remember this uh, one night we went back to the hotel. Uh, we'd gone down for dinner. Uh, my grandfather was in the bar having a drink and what have you, and I said, uh, I'll go back to the hotel room. You know, we're tired and what have you. So I did do. I suppose like any young teenager, you start exploring your body. What I didn't realise is that my grandfather had walked in the bedroom. And uh, that's when the abuse started. I was too afraid to say anything at home. You know, with the homophobic abuse coming from his son, my father, let alone, you know, your, your dad's abusing me. I didn't want to upset my mum. She had enough on her plate. So I didn't say anything. You know, it was like, never happened. In hindsight, Nick wonders if his father Ronald's abusive behaviour stemmed from his own childhood experiences. I fully believe that there was some form of abuse from my grandfather to my father. We know that that kind of abuse at a young age is likely to have lasting psychological impacts. And that's because from a young age, they've been subject to really traumatic events. And that trauma can have a significant impact not only on brain development, but also understanding of healthy and functioning relationships. I didn't know what was right, what was wrong. I didn't feel anything. I was empty by that point. I had no feelings. I was just in survival mode. Yeah, I just remember it's our secret. No, I'm used to keeping secrets. While a teenage Nick focused on surviving his home life, in the late 1990s, DCS Max McLean was called in to reopen the investigation into Leslie Molseed's murder. So obviously once Stefan Kishko's innocence had been proven at course of appeal, the issue, the issue for us at West Yorkshire Police was, well, who was the killer? We began by visiting Delamere Road and the local scene and understanding it, and then, of course, pouring through all the original papers and all the files that we had. Although Ronald Castry wasn't yet a suspect, his reputation was a topic of local gossip. We were at high school and they'd say, oh, your dad that runs that comic shop, yeah, he likes, uh, he likes kids, don't he? And again, I didn't really know what they're all going on about. I knew it was weird. Uh, but I, I just wasn't old enough really to, to realise, I suppose, because it had been my life, and I didn't know anything else. Age just 17, Nick moved out of the family home, taking his mother with him. So my, my dad was at work on this particular day that we decided to do a flit, and we knew we only had a window of so long to just get as much as we could out of the house to set up a new life. Uh, I passed my test, I had my own car, and we just put as much stuff as we could in the car and just did as many trips as I could to the rented house that I'd found. I was running on adrenaline, it, and my mum was a nervous wreck that he would come home and find us. For Nick at 17 to pack up and, and, and say to his mother, right, sort everything out, we're getting out of here, and, and, and taking her away to, to, a safe, to a safe place takes a lot of internal strength and resilience but i also think there's a survival element to this where nick's going it's 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 now or never and that's what gets galvanizes that energy to get the two of them out of there because enough's enough 
In the year 2000, Max McLean finally made a forensic breakthrough in the Leslie Moleseed case. When Leslie was originally found, a piece of sellotape was rolled on a roller and taken across her clothing. Originally, that was to try and see if any hairs or fibres uh, might adhere to that sellotape that might link subsequently to a suspect. But what the wonderful scientists said to me was that the tapings may have semen. So, could we possibly use a new scientific technique to see whether we can remove and extract the semen and sperm heads, of course, from those sellotape tapings and thereby generate a DNA profile. Two DNA profiles were generated from those sellotape tapings. One was Leslie. That was good news for us in terms of establishing the integrity of the sellotape tapings. And we did produce a full DNA profile from the semen, from the sperm in the semen. That is the killer. Wonderful. Where's the match? DNA databases, international databases, anything. No match. They were in a pretty difficult position. It was not until 2005 that Ronald Castry was um, involved with a sex worker. They disagreed about the procedure or the payment and he assaulted her. The police were called to the hotel, but the case was not proceeded with. But a swab was taken from Castry's mouth. And that swab generates a profile which is uploaded on to the DNA database. Then we had a breakthrough for this case. And that was the best phone call I ever received in my 30-year policing career. I got the call from the Forensic Science Service to say, we have a match. So this is where my dad was arrested at the family home. Uh, and to see that in the press, to hear him talking to the police during his arrest, that was hard. Right, listen very carefully to what I've got to say to you now. You were under arrest for the murder of Leslie Susan Molsey. You're joking. Between 12 noon on Sunday, the 5th of October, 1970. I hadn't heard my father's voice in years. Goosebumps ran through me. It's a part of my life that I'd buried, that I'd chosen to not think about. But it may harm your defence if you do not mention, when questioned, something which you later rely on in court. I have no knowledge, and I've certainly never, never met this dead girl or any member of her family. <coughs> I have no knowledge as to how you, you come to, say, a sample of my DNA is found at that place, especially after 30 years. I never once thought that my dad murdered Leslie. I do remember when the police stopped on my door. November 2006, and they said, we've arrested your dad, the murderer of Leslie Mulsey. Said to my mum from door, I'm not surprised. In 2006, 31 years after 11-year-old Leslie Molseed had been found murdered, her killer, Ronald Castry, was finally arrested. He was arrested, interviewed, never had the courage to admit what he'd done. And of course, subsequently, Ronald Castry was charged with the murder of Leslie Molsey. And what did we find out about Ronald Castry? Well, only nine months after killing Leslie, Ronald Castry abducted and indecently assaulted a nine year old girl in the very same area of Rochdale in which Leslie had been abducted from. 
he was also convicted of a similar offence on a child two years after that, in 1978. Despite the fact that they had this direct DNA sample evidence linking Castry to Leslie's murder, he still denied it. But he also had this long history of getting away with crime. He had been fined for a sexual assault previously, he'd been a long-term abuser of multiple of his family members, and he'd attempted assault of another child. So it's likely that by this point, Castry just thought he could get away with it, as he had done his entire life. But thankfully, that wasn't the case. News of Ronald Castry's arrest brought mixed emotions. I was surprised and delighted when I read because I think justice for Leslie and her family were paramount. This was a brutal murder where the killer would be a danger to other children and should be caught, tried, convicted and sent away. From the day that they knocked at my front door and told me that they'd arrested my dad, I never once, never once doubted. I knew he could have done it. I knew he was dangerous. My mum knew. We just couldn't believe that we'd survived it. My mum was so thankful that she had escaped. I think for Nick also, there would be a sense of mixed emotions. Of course there would be. This is also the child who is hearing this from a rational point of view as a man. I knew he was capable of this and thank goodness we survived. But also there's another side, which is this is my parent. How could you do this? And this is a real sense, it is a sense of betrayal because this is not what parents do. Not only did Ronald's family have to deal with the horrific truth of what he'd done to Leslie, his other crimes also came to light. When I was sat with my mum uh, at a mother's house, and they said, the 1976 conviction he's got was for abducting a girl off the street taking her to a derelict house, etc. My mum's face dropped. And I could tell then she was surprised. And I said, if you'd have known what he'd done, would you have stayed with him? She says, you wouldn't be here now. No. She couldn't believe it. I, I, I looked at the police and like, you're tearing strips off my life. I mean, to say that, I've been brought into this world by a serial paedophile. Castry's wife and sons also learnt of his conviction in 1978 for abducting a nine-year-old boy. Well, that brought me that point. And I'm not for one moment saying it's right with uh, any child. But we always thought we were safe because he had three boys. Any, any father, son, memory I had, any relationship I had with this man, it destroyed, it broke. It was all a lie. When he recognised that not only was his dad a paedophile, he was also abusing boys and Nick was never safe. And all the safety mechanisms that he thought he had as a boy, I'm in the safe zone, he's not gonna look at me that way, potentially weren't true. So after giving the lengthy statement to the police, all those skeletons that come flooding out of your closet, I had no choice but to go to the doctors and ask for help. Uh, and. It started me on a therapy course, seeing a therapist on a regular basis just to help me prepare, ready for the trial. I was a nervous wreck. I wasn't sleeping, wasn't eating. I was jumpy at home, waiting for the door to go. Is it the police again? The phone. 
it was it was a living nightmare for 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 nearly twelve months. In October 2007, 32 years after the crime, Ronald Castry faced trial at Bradford Crown Court for the murder of Leslie Molseed. She gave evidence, my mum via video link. She just, she couldn't cope with being in the same room as him, let alone uh, facing all those people. But I remember every day after she gave evidence, right up until the verdict, what if he gets off it? He'll come for me. You know what he's like, he'll come for me. One of the witnesses of the prosecution was the nine-year-old girl who by this date was a grown woman. And she was the most impressive witness you could imagine. And she relived every moment of what happened to her. After the days of, of listening to all the other all the other evidence being uh, given, it was Time for my father to give evidence. And then they called Ronald Castry to the dock. He, uh, he wouldn't look at us in the gallery. He kept his head down. He was sweating uncontrollably. Glasses at the end of his nose. He tried to look smart in this suit, but he ended up unfastening his tie. He was getting muddled up with the questions. It was embarrassing to watch. I remember the moment of Castry's conviction very well. We all filed into the court knowing that the jury uh, wished to come back, had reached a verdict. And I remember sat on the same row as Max and he just put his head down in between his legs. I remember watching him as the verdict came back, guilty. And you could just see the relief in him. And he, he looked to his colleague and nodded. But I do remember that very well, and uh, lifting my head with a, a sense of relief and truly also a sense of pride in that we'd finally brought justice for Leslie. The judge gave Castry a life sentence with a minimum term of 32 years. I remember Leslie's sisters turning to us privately and saying, uh, have a nightmare's just coming to an end, yours is just beginning. Yeah, and, and they gave us uh, a hug. And I could see the sadness in their eyes. I, I just. I didn't appreciate, I didn't realise what they meant. Until weeks, months later, you wake up, it's there, you go to bed, it's there, you go out, and it's there in your head. What he's done, who you are. Every day I wake up knowing I'm the son of a murderer, Ronald Castry. Yes, he might be my dad. I'm nothing like him. I've chosen to go a different way in life, be who I am, be happy. Try and do well in life and make my family proud. Mm -hmm.